Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, where every week we take you to the water cooler here in HPC Engineering, and we talk to some of the scientists and the engineers who are making the cloud a better place for your HPC workloads. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, the open source project and the open source software called NextFlow, which has turned out to be really, really popular in the genomics and healthcare life sciences space. Um, it's spreading its tentacles out into all sorts of other scientific spaces as well, because I think as we observed in the discussion back then, uh, science and scientific research is a workflow. It's not just a bunch of jobs you shove into an HPC cluster and expect to get a eureka moment. The eureka moment happens after you, you know, massage data through an awful lot of different treatments along the way, a lot of judgment calls, a lot of you know, different decisions have to be made and a, and a lot of different processes have to be done on data that are often, you know, very, very much not cluster workloads as well. So uh, NextFlow has got a really, you know, huge, huge role to play inside this research community. Um, but we did promise at the time uh, when we we're talking with Evan from, you know, from Sakara and from the NextFlow team, we did promise at the time that we'd get him back um, to come and talk to us about NextFlow Tower, which is a commercial product that that his company is making uh, to, to sort of go on top of all of these open source pipelines and open source tools to basically manage the whole lot. So uh, very happy to say that uh, Evan Floden is in Barcelona and on the line. Hey, Evan. Hey, thanks a lot, Bruce. Thanks for having me back. Uh, and of course, uh, as always, when we have discussions around, uh, around these kinds of topics, I, I lean on uh, my buddy Angel Pizarro uh, in Philadelphia, who knows so much more about this topic than than I will ever know. Uh, hey, Angel. <laughs> so hey, gentlemen, where do we want to kick off? Um, I I think I think we. I think, uh, I think Evan, you're going to be driving this one. One thing I do want to clarify, though, even though Net Tower is developed by Sakara, which is a commercial entity, I believe it's open source, 100 percent open source. Is that right? Yeah, so we started off with a kind of different model where we wanted to at least you know, begin with a, an open source approach to it. So we had an MPL model for, for launching. We're kind of uh, shifting to a, a kind of dual approach where we have MPL, which is uh, available on GitHub. And then we have the kind of proprietary, which has been, ended up being installed in our you know, customer's environments and in user environment. I would stress though, like in the main and the easiest way to get into Tower is to go to tower.nf. It's a free hosted service that we have for evaluating the product, for trying it out, and it's just kind of an easy turnkey solution uh, for, for getting going. So that's the kind of the, the main approach for it. Yeah, so it was probably you know it was good. It was good five years into the Nextflow journey before we sort of really started to take the first steps and started to plan about, about what Nextflow Tower or would be Tower eventually would become. It started out really in conversations with users, with people essentially needing uh, needing something more beyond the command line tool. I mean, Nextflow is fantastic in what it can do, but there are still limitations associated with these kind of tools, like it's still single user, single execution, and it doesn't have, for example, a database on the back end for storing all of the, for storing all of your runs. It doesn't have a UI for monitoring, and there were certain like services that we wanted to be able to provide in an application that you that you couldn't do from something like Nextflow. We had a lot of requirements sort of coming about from people who wanted a, a GUI, and this comes about from people develop pipelines. They are a bioinformatician, and they share it with their group. Maybe they share it with people in the lab. They share it with other people around the world. And they want to then take those pipelines and to run them without having to look into the, the nitty gritty of a, of a command line and exactly how an option is applied or, or figuring that out. So providing a kind of interface into that. And then it's kind of switched around a little bit into also being able to be a tool for admins because now you can, if you can provision the infrastructure and you can provide access management and role-based access to that, then you can kind of get the flip side of that. So. We think of it as almost like a spectrum. At one end is um, users who just want to launch from a GUI. The other end is like admins who, who want to manage. And in the middle is the kind of the workflow developers who want to, want to publish their, their, their pipelines. Okay, so it's part of that whole it's part of that whole separation of the layers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but at the very base of it, you've 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 abstracted the infrastructure underneath, so that people don't have to think about the itty bitty details of that. 
Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. And yeah, get, and again, going back to it a little bit like Nextflow does, I think the value proposition is very much the same. It's like focus on the science. Um, you don't have to really worry about the infrastructure. And then we kind of take it sort of one step later by by being able to kind of do that at the kind of service level. So not just thinking about it at the workflow level, but at the whole all of your infrastructure that you run, whether that's the pipelines, the credentials, whether that is the compute environments, etc. So kind of kind of going into that. One thing that we kind of Another thing I think maybe is a slightly interesting design decision was was to make it really uh, instead of going down like a SaaS application. So there was, there's, a, there's quite a few people who create kind of SaaS applications for running for running pipelines, and we kind of wanted to make the decision very early on that we wanted this to be very flexible. We wanted it to be able to be deployed on your laptop if you wanted, or run in your cluster, or installed into ECS or into EKS wherever you want to raise run tower. Um, and, and therefore, we kind of wanted to do sort of a, 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 a new, um, new kind of way of developing applications that had been done previously. So we used a, a technology called Micronaut, which is a kind of microservices architecture. It's essentially a few containers and, and a database on the, on the back end, but it makes the application very portable and then sort of easy to install um, wherever, you, wherever you want. Other things we're kind of we're thinking about um, in that regard is, is a clear separation between where the application is deployed and where the workloads run. And we mm -hmm. want to be like you can you can deploy Tower say uh, on your laptop and you can be running the workload in AWS, or you could be um, have it installed on your on-premise cluster, maybe submitting to Slurm, and then in moments you can also switch that up, have a computer environment connect to batch. And, and fire off those jobs there. So that's very similar to the way Nextflow runs. And in fact, mm -hmm. what's happening on the back end is, is it's really just running Nextflow. It's a, it's a service for running Nextflow. So we can leverage Nextflow's different executors that we, talk, we spoke about last time for. Um, oh, so, for like, the, so like a control tower, which is probably where tower comes exactly, in. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a real control tower for, uh, for, for management of workflows, absolutely. So I'm just going to show you now uh, tower.nf. So this is uh, so you can sign up to. You can log in with your, your GitHub credentials here. You can sign in with your email, et cetera. And the, we kind of built an authentication system using like OpenID Connect as well. So if you have organizations who have got their own setups here. The main thing, the main thing we started with was really around monitoring of the workflows. And that was something that was sort of required from people. They didn't have visibility on, on what was happening with those pipelines. So I can go into a particular run, say here, and I want to jump into RNA seq pipeline. People are pretty familiar, pretty familiar with this. And you can see on the back end here that this is running Nextflow. Um, in this case, it's an it's an AWS batch. And you can see the kind of command line which gets run. I can see the parameters, configuration, and I can even relaunch the job here. You can see if I get an execution log from that. So this monitoring and being able to uh, understand what's happening with particular workflows and really having a database of this was, was one of the core things that we started with. And this was kind of uh, made it very easy as well. So another design decision, I would say, from the beginning to, to make it easy for people to transition from Nextflow, the command line, to Tower. So add an option where you can just say with Tower and with a pointed um, to here. So you can get a kind of onboarding experience for people um, to get started with quickly. And that's, that's been very popular um, as well here. Other things that are kind of interesting here are around um, the statistics that we take. So we're able to gather all the, all the kind of metrics that are used from each of the individual tasks and then to aggregate them. So you can store all of that information again in the database. And that means that we can also do that at the, at the task level. So not sort of an aggregate workflow, but individual tasks. So I could jump into a particular tasks here. I can see the command which was run. So these are bioinformatics tasks, so typically command line in this case. You can see some information on the, the work directory. Here it's an S3 bucket, uh, the execution time, and the resources that were requested. So here we're running a bio containers wow. container um, in a forge queue. So two CPUs, uh, six gigs of memory here. And this is running on an R4 large instance in, in EU West One. Yeah. Interesting thing that we sort of had had some sort of requirements around was, was was people wanting kind of cost transparency. There's a concern, I guess, if, uh, you know, running in the cloud and, and allowing uh, people to have access to that information in a kind of easy to, to grasp way, to have a kind of concept of, of how much they're spending. We built a database on the back here, uh, which contains all of the, the costs for all the cloud providers, different instances, different regions, et cetera, to, to really capture that information. This has been something which has been 
uh, super useful uh, as well and sort of one of the features that, that's really requested. Right. So that, that's incredible. actually interesting because that's, that's sort of bringing the cost part of the execution down into a meaningful unit because it's not, you're not displaying cost per core per hour, you know, for an EC2 instance plus the cost of the EBS that's attached to it and the S3 that's supporting it. You're showing the cost per RNA seq workflow. Yeah, and you and US dollars, like everyone <laughs> needs to hear. So yeah, it's exa exactly right. that. So right. it kind of tries to put it into something which is which is a little bit more uh, concrete. It cost me thirty cents to run this workflow, and that is a much more meaningful number to a scientist than is all of the component costs of the infrastructure underneath. So it's, I mean, that exactly uh, that's then, that's a that's a good way to do it. And then the kind of flip side of the of, of the cost is you you want to you want to make sure that your pipeline itself is requesting the right amount of resources because it's all good that you you know that you you know spend X amount but how much of that how much ban you get in for that for your bucket how efficient are you in terms of your resources requested so next next for tasks when they submit to batch each of them will ask for a number of CPUs and, and an amount of memory and those tasks those jobs then get placed into the queue and they get sort of scheduled onto the instances like we saw before. Here, you can kind of visualize that in terms of allocation. So you can see of the memory that we've asked for, you can see this is not a relatively uh, optimized pipeline. The reason for this is I'm running on some test data here, so it's quite small. But what you can start to do is, is tune this here. So you can tune that your particular processes will uh, request the correct amount of, of, of resources there and then, and then start to utilize that um, in, a, in a much better way. Interesting when it comes to batch, what we've observed here is, is that by doing this, you kind of get a twofold um, speed up because if you request less resources, you end up getting kind of more tasks onto the same amount of VMs. So you get sort of an additional uh, increase there and then obviously it speeds up a lot because there's, there's more instances available. Mm -hmm. and, and and the cost models do account for um, you know multiple jobs running on a single instance as well so yeah yeah that's a little, little, a little bit tricky math there you kind of have to think yeah. about it slots um, but, but but absolutely awesome and and in terms I saw that you had spot costs uh, are you are you sort of monitoring that in real time as things are executing or is it just you know something on the back end and it's an I see the word estimate there because you know until the bill comes through, the bill the, the bill doesn't come through. Uh, what are you guys doing in terms of sort of modeling variable charges like uh, like spot? Um, yeah, so we we actually took a third party service um, for doing that, and then we okay. basically put all of the the prices using an API in, into Tal. I think it does in the one hour updates. Um, Got it. So it's it's up to date. The estimate actually comes about from the, the first part of your question around. How, you know how you pack those those jobs into so that 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 can become a little bit tricky um, for doing, but but it's kind of it balances out in the end, right? But I mean, it, you know, I've I, you guys are taking the right approach, certainly for these kinds of workloads, and and part of that um, sort of statefulness that that Nextflow brings to the workflow, or at least the understanding of the state, you know, the state transitions. You guys can actually run in a in a highly unpredictable environment like Spot. You know where and and get an extraordinary amount of value out of that. So, you you're kind of putting wheels on that bike for the customer, and then you know, yeah, um, uh, it's much easier for them to 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 drive. The the other thing I'll point out is that I I love how you're looking at resources and price within the same dashboard because you know our group does a lot of price over performance because uh, some some customers will want you know one over the other and, and, and really depending on the time that the results need to come in, they may be willing to, to uh, you know, allocate larger resources that might have other things available to them. Um, uh, for instance, additional slot GP, uh, slots in the, in the CPU, uh, they might not be using all of a, a GPU instance, all the cards in the GPU instance, but they can maximize the CPU utilization for the overall job. So in terms of percent allocation, you don't you don't see them, or, or better yet, uh, they don't use up all the memory on an instance given uh, given the size of the CPUs, but they use up all the CPU slots to go much much faster. So our the folks can take a look at what's the what's the resource that's important to me, what's the percent utilization, and the cost for that, and then compare it across different different uh, allocations. 
Yeah, and it's, exa- it's exactly that, that comparison um, which we've, we're starting to look at now as we come to do some sort of more serious benchmarking. And uh, so it was, as, as part of that, one of the sort of fantastic blog which came out uh, end of last week, which was really looking at that, was running a GTK pipeline, so real real life pipelines here, and looked at the different costs across the instance types here. So there was it was looking at um, Cs and Ms. And really trying to understand exactly what happened there. I can actually flip up some. Is this the? Uh, is this this one? The Diamond Age. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah this blog. This blog post um, from friends over at Diamond uh, Diamond Age. They did, a, they did a great job of of creating some pipelines and then running some real serious benchmarks over over many different um, uh, instance types. There. What we can do is I can I can bring up some of those results and we can we can talk a yeah. little bit about them on the in the yeah, report. I'll make sure that I put the. Uh, I'll make sure that I put the. Um, uh, I'll put the the address to that blog. I'll put the URL for that blog post into the show notes so everybody can have a read. Yeah, just before you get into the results, uh, just a little bit of background. The, the that is a port that that Diamond Age and Secure did of the GATK best practices pipeline, uh, which is available from the Broad. Uh, it's that the Broad, you know, obviously uses a different workflow language and a different le- workflow engine. Um, but you know, the next flow is essentially repeating that. And the other thing that I'll say is that some of this is um, these are artificial benchmarks in that they stood up an environment to test an instance type and then immediately brought it down. Whereas in real life, some of some of the things that you'll see here, are, are especially in terms of the overhead of spot for runtime costs, will be amortized over the life of your real life workloads. This is just showing you, you know, yeah. brand new environment, new instance, and let's take a look at what it does. Evan, can we can we go sort of move over to a to an actual demo of the product? Let's get into the guts and the gore and show us more to the point how easy it is to actually get all this stuff up and running. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get stuck in and, and try and create this environment and, and kind of show you show you how you can do that. So I'm going to now just jump in here and I'm going to create um, a what we call organization here. And I've created one here for, for uh, HPC Tech Shorts. Jump into great company that. Yep. Jump. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great organization. Come in People here. We have a concept of, of computer environments here. And this computer environment really can be um, anywhere that the Nextflow pipeline is going to run. So I'm first just going to create a new environment here. I have got nothing set up um, at all. The only thing I have is uh, is an S3 bucket in this case. So I'm going to create this one. I'm going to call it uh, AWS uh, Batch in this case. And let's just call this um, uh, S3 so we kind of know what's going on here. I'm going to choose the platform here. So we support obviously traditional batch schedulers as well. I'm going to have to enter in some credentials at this moment here. Uh, when you click here, you can kind of see the requirements for this. Typically, we tell our customers to go set up uh, the permissions here associated for that. And my credentials here, I'm just going to say AWS, put in my access key, uh, put in my secret key here. And this is obviously a simplified way of doing this and creating that. Now it's going to be able to use my key to look up using the, the APIs here. For example, the regions that are available to me, I'm going to go create this in Paris. I've got a pipeline work directories. It's going to show wow. me all the S3 buckets which are available um, in my location. Let's choose something in Paris. Obviously, it makes makes sense to have the S3 bucket same location. And what this is forge mode is now going to create all of those resources for us. So I want to create, create a spot compute environment, 256 CPUs. I'm going to do this EBS auto scaling. And if you think back to that diagram that we had before, this is this is the increasing that size of that EBS file system as files come in and in and out. And here I can um, sort of go in and choose particular options. If I want to use EFS, if I want to use FSX, I could do that. If I want to use some particular instance types, um, so I know in, in the uh, in the benchmark we saw before. So from going through some of the documentation there, um, they were using uh, instance types. I think they were using um, some C5s. So we'll choose some C5s. And again, you can see it uses the API to do that. I can choose allocation strategy from the from the paper. I know they were using the, the, the capacity here. I could put on all of these things. It's really optional here. You really only have to select a couple of things and create that environment. Now, this will take a few seconds to create. It's going to go through. And, and if I jump into my AWS account now, I would be able to see those resources um, being, being developed. Let's think about launching a pipeline though now. So this is going to take a few seconds to do. I now want to like go run something real here. And let's like go back and thinking about um, pipelines which we can take off the shelf. And we talked about GATK before, but there's also some fantastic pipelines 
uh, also developed by the NF Core community. So I'm going to select and run a kind of basic RNA seq pipeline um, here. You're, you're putting our cloud engineering training organization out of business here because you're just making this too easy. Um, I think this is really cool. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a really kind of big problem of, of, of people who, who you know, come from backgrounds, really from scientific backgrounds, who, you know, who are not HPC admins and, and really don't want to get into this stuff, however, however interesting it is. No, for, they shouldn't need to be. Us. They totally shouldn't need to be. So this is, this is exactly what they, what they need. So now let's imagine that we want to add a pipeline that we want to be create um, from, from one of the users and make it available to everyone um, in, in the environment. So I'm now going to create a new pipeline here. I'm going to take something from, say, from NF Core. So I'm going to select the pipeline repository. I'm going to, I'm going to enter that in inside the pipeline to launch. You can see that this environment that we just created is available for us here. I'm going to enter in the name of the pipeline. And then finally, I'm going to enter in um, the, a config profile. So I just want to run some test data to run that through. I could even put in a revision here, and this is actually looking up the Git API to show us which branches are available, which releases, you know, a particular merge that I wish to run, for example, and then we'll create this pipeline. Now, this pipeline is not available for everyone in my workspace. I can select the pipeline I wish to run, and this will render a form for me for all of the different inputs that are associated with that pipeline. This comes from, a, from an Explore schema. Uh, which is defined in the repository. I'm going to keep everything default, but if I wish to, maybe I want to choose a particular filtering that I wish to do. So remove right RNA, go down to the, to the end here through the options and launch that pipeline. So there you've seen in a couple of minutes, we've created all of the AWS infrastructure. We've gone to GitHub, we've pulled the repository, we've connected it with some data, and we're now launching that pipeline. And I can now add in participants here so it just happens to be you here, Wolf, as well, yep. who can then go and launch that pipeline itself, can see these results, can now, you can go launch into that same AWS environment that we just created um, and, and then start monitoring those workflows as we as we saw before. My mind blown. I mean, that, I, I, that you just did in like five <laughs> minutes what yeah. takes most people like five months to figure out by reading yeah. all the documentation. Absolutely. Plus, uh, I love this concept of, of shared workspaces to be able to collaborate with folks across mm. different organizations and institutions. That's really fantastic. Um, mm. Not not just for basically getting the work done, but also afterwards, being able to share that work and being able to to make progress or iteration on the workflows. That's that's pretty fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. We've got a lot of things coming up in this. We're still really early days in this couple of problems we're thinking about um, around both the input of the data. So how can we make that easier? Also, there's kind of concerns around how can you make the access of that data? So using this model um, really efficient as well. So you can think about ways that you could apply permissions to that data. We're working on a data sets functionality and in the output of that, like the results, the the, the reports, et cetera, and making all of that uh, intertied with with, uh, with what's available here and kind of closing a little bit of the circle um, there for, for a lot of uh, workflow users. And you could you could pretty easily have these workflows constructed so that um, uh, they could also be running on your on-premises equipment as well, make use of your on-prem cluster as well as making use of the cloud when you need it. Um, the whole thing through the same pane of glass. Yeah, exactly. If you if you um, say you could, you know we we have an example we have instances set up in AWS running Slurm, so I could sit in here, uh, select my Slurm workflow manager. Again, the credentials here would not be. Uh, AWS credentials, these would be SSH credentials. So yeah. I would put in here a uh, private key. I would choose my username, um, the, the directories, and then I would choose the actual queue, queue name. So this is a Slurm queue in this case, and the compute queue in, in Slurm. And then that would be available. Everything is happening on the same layer there. So I get all of the same monitoring. I get all of the same sort of uh, view of, of those pipelines. I could even tie those pipelines to a Slurm environment, et cetera. Um, and, and it kind of works in the same way. You know, this is this is fantastic. Folks that are able to leverage it, um, just at Tower NF, um, which is which is pretty great. Uh, our, a lot of biotech and pharma customers actually want commercial support uh, for these solutions, and that's available from from you guys at, at Sakara, uh, which is great. If you want to find out more information, go there. Uh, and again, that that URL to Tower, so that you can kick the tires, uh, is available here. Anything else we want to highlight, gents? Because this has been really uh, feature-packed 
That's fantastic. Just a shout out to the, to the people from Diamond Age for, for doing those yeah. demos. It was a you know great blog post. Uh, we're really excited about this, and hopefully, we're gonna. It's going to be the first of many in terms of us taking this technology further, like really seeing what the limits are, and then again on the other side, making it accessible for, for people, for scientists to use. So we're really kind of thinking about here uh, longer term as well. Evan, thanks for coming in, talking about this. Thanks for showing us your your very very cool toy. Um, <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's a, I think a we're going to have to, we're going to have to come back to to dive deeper over time into some of those storage topics about when to use when to use things like FSx for Lustre underneath these workflows rather than you know EBS or S3 etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think you know there's going to be some more sophisticated discussion and deeper dives in those areas that we have to have. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, for now, this is just a really awesome way to, to kick off. If anybody out there uh, has any, you know, if you've got uh, uh, some other topics that you'd like to see us dive deeper into, uh, things that you'd like to see us show on the, you know, on the Tech Shorts channel, please DM us on Twitter. Our DMs are open. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and for now, uh, thanks both. See you guys soon.